Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Cranky with the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative in Cloquet, Minnesota. It's a nice day out today, a little cloudy, but uh, typical winter weather. Uh, we have about 47 people online today, uh, which is a really nice audience, a lot of DNR foresters out there. Um, so our topic today is prescribed burn liability, and our instructor is Doug Rigdon. He's the senior vice president of Rigdon and Associates out of Naperville, Illinois. So I'm going to go through a few logistics before we begin, and then I'll turn it over to Doug. Uh, it, you'll see on your screen the chat pod on the left, uh, right under Doug's uh, photograph. If you have questions, just feel free to click onto that chat, chat pod. It's uh, down below that narrow box. And then you can type in your questions, and then to the right, uh, you click on that button, and uh, your questions will go up uh, for uh, Doug to be able to, to see them and to answer your questions. So the webinar is approximately one hour long. Uh, Doug's presentation will be about 35, 45 minutes. And then uh, afterwards, uh, we'll go into more questions. If you have questions during Doug's presentation, just feel free to uh, type them in at any time. If you're a certified forester or a stewardship plan writer, as you check in, make sure to put F, uh, FSP or CPCF behind your name so that we can record your names in the stewardship plan writer tracking system. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce Doug. Uh, the workshop today, uh, many of uh, you are involved, probably most of you, with uh, prescribed burn liability. Uh, the webinar is intended to provide you with information to work through the, the major issues of burn liability, working with major agencies, jurisdictions, and private landowners. And so Mr. Rigdon is a 1971 graduate, has completed significant postgraduate study in organ organizational communication from Western Illinois University, Macomb, Illinois. His nearly 39-year career in insurance sales, brokerage, and risk management has included the ownership of two highly successful commercial uh, insurance agencies. Over the past two years, he has spoken on the subject of prescribed fire legal liability and risk management to many different states and regional conservation organizations, including groups in Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, Florida, Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. C.D. Rigdon and Associates was founded in 2006 and is an independent insurance agency based in Naperville, Illinois. It writes a complete line of property liability and related casualty insurance policies for many commercial clients. C.D. Rigdon is a leading provider of commercial liability insurance to the prescribed fire community. Throughout his career, Mr. Rigdon has assisted a widely diverse group of clients on a national and international level involving highly complex risk management needs. So with that introduction, uh, I would like to introduce Doug Rigdon and uh, thank him for uh, providing his expertise today. So Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hope you're warm wherever you are. Um, I'm from the Chicago metro area. This is a little bit new for me. I have done this uh, presentation um, several times, which we'll talk about through the morning session. On the way to work this morning, I was thinking of the old uh, Woody Allen line about um, if, you, if you're ever really uh, bored, uh, try spending a couple of hours with an insurance salesman. Well, you get me for not a couple of hours, but you get me for a little while. I've been an insurance salesman, broker, and insurance agency owner for a long, long time. I took on this whole aspect of prescribed fire liability in 2007. We, uh, uh, as a result of a study that we read from the, a University of Wisconsin professor and a consultant in, the, in Iowa by the name of Tom Buman, 
And we really developed a following countrywide. The, the subject of prescribed fire liability is certainly a huge issue to many forestry groups, as, as many of you are involved. Uh, and it's also a very, very highly complex subject that we're not going to uh, do much but other than really touch the surface today. In giving this presentation to a number of groups, just this year I've been at the Kansas Natural Resources Conference. I was just in Iowa two weeks ago to a group of about 150 landowners, forestry professionals, and other folks that have an interest in this. I, I've always kind of um, tried to find a, a happy medium with the audience, trying to make sure that we're touching on all needs for all parts of the group. Basically, what I want you to grab today's session is, is um, it's a better understanding of the risk of prescribed fire, certainly. Um, we, we notice around the country that there are many states that have not passed uh, statutory changes that would, would um, limit the liability of the burner. Certainly, that's part of our subject material this morning. We want to make sure that you all come away with some of the critical elements of tort liability. Uh, certainly, because we have an audience made up of public employees and private individuals, there's a real difference between the liability issues between those two groups. I'll touch on some of that for you. I also want many of you to come away today with knowing that even though some individuals have insurance, there's clearly some limitations in the policy forms that either private contractors or even landowners may be buying, and we'll touch on some of that. We'll also talk about some basic risk mitigation strategies. So with that, let's kind of touch base. I ask that each of you, um, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me, or if you can, type in the chat line, and we'll try to answer those questions as quickly as we can. What we observe in not only in Minnesota, but certainly in Iowa and most of the western, Midwestern states um, is that prescribed fire is certainly a manageable exposure, but it has a significant and catastrophic loss potential. Uh, I don't think it surprises anybody. We've certainly seen some large dollar claims both with public employee groups and private individuals. We also find that there is certainly a demand in the Midwest that's not being satisfied by local landowners. My connection with your group uh, was in part, and Mike in particular, an introduction by Walt Gessler from the DNR in Minnesota. Walt picked up some information on us, and we've had a number of conversations since last fall. And I understand that in Minnesota, that pent-up demand is perhaps even higher than some other states. One of the factors that I think is obvious to most uh, that are in uh, some aspect of the forestry business is the number of trained professionals in prescribed fire is really very low. And I think the, to add to that, the number of people that really understand the risk uh, factors is even lower. We, we've talked to forestry groups, uh, uh, groups from the Association of Consulting Foresters, in South Carolina, the Society of American Foresters and groups in Alabama, Virginia. And I don't know that, that I walk away in any one of those sessions where I really have a good feeling that people understand some of these risks. That's both good and bad. In one sense, it means that folks are, have not been sued or they haven't really had any legal issues. On the other side, it also is bad because they really don't know how these claims develop. Um, we also kind of find in talking with groups, particularly landowner groups, that not understanding or having limited access to information about the risk for prescribed fire um, really could be a deterrent in and of itself. When we began this uh, whole approach toward prescribed fire, we found there really is, uh, was not a huge database of information about claims uh, I think in part due to the fact that many of the larger fire escapes have, have uh, occurred on federal forest lands or state lands 
where they're self-insured by those respective entities. Private burners have not. We'll talk about some claims today that have had uh, some significant impact. Um, the, lastly, on this page, and it's a point that I, I, I've found uh, to be true in almost every state, is we're seeing prescribed fire being conducted not only by foresters and private landowners, but burn contractors as well, where they're not properly insured or they have no insurance at all. Pent-up demand for, for, for prescribed fire. Certainly we know that most states have had very conservative burn policies, and by and large we think that has suppressed uh, the use of fire, uh, prescribed fire. We know that ultimately uh, some of those attitudes have to change if we're going to reintroduce uh, the use of fire as a uh, natural and manageable and cost-effective tool for improving some habitats. Uh, I, I know in certain states, uh, Walt has told me in Minnesota, you have some CRP land that needs to be burned by contract. I think the statute now says on, a, on the current 10-year contract, it has to be burned once. And on the 15-year contract, it has to be burned twice. So there's certainly some uh, demand for burning. Just to talk a little bit about the loss potential, one example I put on the slide here was an, a situation that occurred last fall, uh, late last summer in the Helena National Forest. Uh, 2,000 acres were burned. Originally, it was slated to be less than a couple of hundred acres. It escaped to 2,000 in a high wind situation. 26 homes were damaged or destroyed. But the most significant statistic on this page is there were over $2 million of fire suppression expenses and I think that number in and of itself attests to the, the very nature of, of the magnitude of the catastrophe with prescribed fire. For those of you that are governmental or state or federal employees that are listening in this morning, we, we frequently uh, get to these meetings and we talk a little bit about the, the differences between a, a liability perspective from a governmental employee versus a private individual. Um, as the information shows on the slide, prior to 1946, the, the federal government basically upheld the doctrine of sovereign immunity and basically gave uh, federal employees uh, immunity from that statute. It has since been updated a couple of times. The original Federal Tort Claims Act was passed in 1946, and it basically says that all the federal employees may be um, are, are not liable while they're acting within the scope of their employment. And what generally happens in these situations is if a federal employee, a forest employee, were, were sued, um, the defense lawyers make an initial argument. They change the defendant from the individual to the United States government, and it makes it much harder for that individual to be sued. In 1988, the Federal Employees Liability Reform and Tort Compensation Act was passed and basically does, again, reaffirms that immunity from uh, any kind of uh, tort liability. In Minnesota, um, you have a Tort Claims Act that like is similar and is designed to follow the, the track of the Federal Tort Claims Act. And it basically was just recently updated last year, caps the damages for individual claims, uh, after 2009, July 1, and uh, at a half a million for individual claims and a million and a half for a single occurrence. Um, and it basically says that, that state volunteers and employees are not personally liable for any claims while acting within the scope of their employment. And that is, in fact, the, the real key with liability. If you're a state employee listening in this morning, as it is with a federal employee, making sure that you're, you're following that track of your employment definition. And both of these statutes, federal and state, essentially follow this key term of discretionary function. It basically means um, that um, individuals must be able to operate within their own discretionary authority to act without having the threat 
of any kind of potential liability. Where we've seen some issues, and certainly this is a subject for another presentation and discussion, but for those of you that are federal or state employees listening in, um, had many cases now with federal law, enforce, law enforcement uh, employees and um, firefighting uh, employees where uh, that personal liability and immunity uh, gets a little more gray and it gets a little cloudy. And the issues have been certainly that in federal law enforcement cases, many times in a wrongful weapon discharge, uh, individuals can be held accountable for their, some of their own defense. We, in, in the 30-mile fire is one example of a federal employee was charged with involuntary manslaughter and was forced to pay some of those costs. So we, we think that there are some long-term issues that need to be ferreted out. And we will, we will ultimately come back with more information if you're interested on that subject. Private individuals do not enjoy immunity from uh, that same level. We know that, um, that prescribed fire has catastrophic potential for injury or wrongful death, damage certainly to others' property. What a lot of folks that we talk to at these conferences don't realize is that smoke uh, really has two liability sort of uh, potentials. One is, as we know, naturally it can be an obscurant, create a traffic uh, condition or a fog-like condition that could potentially create an, an automobile accident. Um, but smoke also can act as a pollutant. Virtually all commercial insurance and certainly most personal insurance policies exclude and have an absolute exclusion for pollution liability. One of the things that we've talked about, particularly in Texas, where we have a lot of NRCS uh, assistance in writing burn plans, that again could be a subject for another discussion, is where we have a, a public employee participation in a private burn. And, and there becomes a, a very gray area about the liability issues. Generally, when public employees are involved in a private burn, most of, if not all, of the liability will shift to the, the private landowner or the contractor performing the burn. Prescribed fire statutes. I believe it's now well in excess of, well in excess of 20 states that have fat, passed formal prescribed fire statutes. Generally, they have a couple of objectives. One is to regulate the safe use of prescribed fire. And certainly, some states have taken it to the next level, and they've established uh, prescribed burn manager requirements and even certification standards. Most of the Midwest states, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, uh, have not formally filed um, their own statutes. We believe that ultimately a prescribed fire is going to be uh, a, a more frequent um, land management tool, and its usage will increase to what forestry professionals would like to see. We feel that statutorily, Minnesota would clearly have to step up with some change that would limit or reduce the potential liability for the burner. Also, by doing so, they're going to establish a standard of care. And we think that will ultimately increase some of that usage. States with uh, preferred uh, prescribed fire statutes, Texas, Georgia, and Florida have, the, have what we feel are the best statutes and would be a clear model for Minnesota or any other Midwestern state. Personally, I, uh, I like the statute in Texas. Basically, um, Texas uh, came to the table uh, 10 to 12 years ago when they passed their statute. It essentially gives the landowner uh, immunity from any liability if they hire a Texas certified prescribed burn manager. While many states have re been reluctant to go that far, Georgia and Florida uh, statutorily change their laws, and they use a gross negligence theory, which I'll talk about in a minute, 
Texas follows a negligence theory. Uh, Minnesota, uh, by and large, does not have a statute, um, although uh, the negligence uh, theory of, of the law, which we'll talk about in a minute. Again, we believe that your state really can step up if you see the need. And I, I guess our whole discussion with statutory change is really predicated on if fire is going to be used as a land management tool and used more actively, some of those changes have to be made. It doesn't surprise anybody that the United States is the most litigious society in the world. I pulled this statistic the other day from a uh, actuarial report in 2009. Believe it or not, U.S. tort systems costs were in excess of $248 billion, which favorably was down somewhat from 2008. But that translates to a rather staggering number of $808 for every living person in the United States. The law is a business. And you have to really respect and understand what the potential uh, for legal liability really is. As a kind of a working man's definition, legal liability is con generally considered an obligation to pay a monetary award for injury or damage to a third party that is caused by one's own negligence or statutorily prohibited actions. With these kinds of uh, insurance policies we'll talk about in a minute. We're generally dealing with negligence. Negligence, by and large, is simply, in, in a lay definition, the duty to do something or prevent something from happening, a failure to honor that duty, injury, damage, or financial loss that would occur, and that injury or damage is directly a result of your actions or inactions. Why worry about the threat of legal liability with prescribed fire? Well, I talk to small businesses all the time. And generally, it's a risk of, of being in business or, or performing any outdoor activity that any one of us individually or our businesses can be sued uh, at any given time. And it's just an inherent risk of doing business that you have that risk. What we find after 35 plus years of being in business is it's just uh, all too often um, sort of a characteristic of a small business or even an individual that they tend to ignore the depth of the risk. Um, I, and I'll give you all an example. I, I work with a couple of landowners that own in excess of 4,000 acres in the state of Georgia. There are two sisters that have inherited this land. And one of the sisters is married to a retired judge from the United States tax court system who happened to be on the phone with me just yesterday. And then in this conversation, we talked about how they tried to engage a forester in Georgia to burn about a 600-acre parcel of a, uh, of a longleaf pine uh, property that they own there, and how reluctant um, the, the forester was to sign a contractual relationship to do the burn, only to find out that the, that the forester, who's been in business well in excess of 30 years, has never had insurance for prescribed burning. And I think we find that to be evident in almost every state. As you might suspect, I don't personally believe that it's practical today to assume any kind of risk. We certainly believe that prescribed fire is an insurable um, process. And there are plenty of markets out there, which we'll talk about in a minute, that can offer you some insurance protection. What do we fail to realize? Well, I get a comment frequently from small business people that uh, often tell me, well, Doug, I don't really need all that insurance. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're a small business. You know, if I get sued, I'm just going to throw the keys on the desk and they can have my business. Folks, let me tell you that that just doesn't work. That, that the reality is that even nuisance lawsuits have to be defended. And the cost of the defense is staggering in the United States, as evidenced from that statistic on the prior slide. 
What we also don't realize is that lawsuits can be a huge personal and business interruption. They take a lot of time. And in, if you're a small business listening in today, you just simply cannot recover all of that time. So you know, it's not a matter of just walking away from these claims. The picture on the slide shows <clears throat> a, an example of what would be a normal sort of run-of-the-mill fire in Louisiana. They perform a lot of sugar cane burns at the end of the season to burn a lot of the leaf trash off the cane stalks. Uh, in 2008, a friend of mine who's with the Colony Insurance Company, and they write a, a commercial farm liability program, had this particular claim. It was not an escape, but a smoke plume uh, had carried some 12 to 15 miles, uh, had an inversion, created a fog-like condition. Uh, there were um, five or six vehicles involved in a multi-car pileup, one death, and Colony's um, payout on the claim was $2 million, their maximum limit. So again, even on a well-prescribed uh, uh, burn, the significance of the damages can be staggering. Basically, there are four principles of, of legal liability that we'll talk about here briefly. I'm going to concentrate primarily on negligence theories, but they are nuisance, simple and gross negligence, strict liability, and trespass. Um, negligence, as it's defined here, is basically the failure to use such care as a reasonably prudent and careful person would use under similar circumstances. Uh, that, that is the theory that would be argued by an attorney who would be suing you in the event of a claim. Gross negligence, on the other hand, which is more difficult to prove, merely indicates that you as the burner uh, intentionally failed to perform a duty in some way or you recklessly disregarded uh, the potential consequences. Uh, as I said a minute ago, only a couple of states in the United States uh, use the gross negligence theory being Florida and Georgia. Um, negligence is the common theory, although there are four states that actually um, will um, apply the uh, strict liability theory, which basically says that liability is imposed regardless of the care exercised. It doesn't apply in Minnesota. However, it does in Oklahoma, um, Wyoming, uh, Connecticut and New Hampshire, I believe, are the four states. What is a prescribed fire liability risk? I get asked that question a lot at these conferences. Uh, basically, there are four sort of pieces to a potential claim to property, uh, to um, persons, uh, to cost to defend, and fire suppression are the categories I've outlined there, obviously. If a, if a private property is damaged or destroyed, that would be a potential liability to the burner. However, also if it's some sort of commercial property where it has a usage day to day, the loss of use of that, ex that property could also be an expense. If people are injured or, uh, you know, as bad as it may sound, um, Killed in a, in a prescribed burn, obviously the medical rehabilitation or burial costs, temporary loss wages, or any even permanent income loss would also be expenses. The cost to defend uh, would be a, um, a huge uh, potential expense. And as we talked a minute ago, we're starting to see in many different jurisdictions around the country that fire suppression expenses are now being charged in the event of an escape or any potential loss, those expenses are being charged back to the burner where allowable by law. As a risk mitigation strategy, uh, we, you know, liability insurance is just one of uh, the many different tools you have available. In its simplest form, insurance is basically a risk financing tool where you as the, as the burner or the potential landowner are merely transferring your um, assumption of any risk to a 
a third-party insurance company. Uh, and in, in our country, to be very, very candid with you, insurance is not only the most affordable, but may be the only really viable risk financing method for small prescribed fire exposures. Doug, we have uh, talked. Pardon me, Doug. There's a couple of questions. I, I see that. To yeah. Okay. Thank you. The question is: If a state employee, we are reviewing plans for private contractors. Do we have any liabilities? Well, that's an interesting question, and I'm not an attorney, but I'll give you my lay view of that because it happens a lot. We see NRCS offices uh, designing burn plans, and um, many different states, uh, and I think you have to be very, very careful uh, in that regard as to whether your job description specifically defines performing that activity. It, it also, uh, you know, has a direct application um, uh, if you're assisting in the burn, and I think you, again, have to be very, very careful with that. I'll come back to that question uh, as we get um, more uh, toward the end of the, the whole presentation. When I talk to groups around the country, uh, and I, Barb, I see your question, what is the liability of a township or city fire department doing a private prescribed burn? And let me come back to that question in a minute because I want to talk about something that I think is very important to um, particularly any landowners, but for you, uh, public employees that are working with landowners locally, I think this is a big issue. We've talked to many different small landowner groups. In Oklahoma, we, we see a number of them. In Texas, uh, we're working with a group there called the Edwards Plateau Prescribed Burn Association, which is a group of about 350 ranch owners that frequently do a lot of volunteer, neighbor-to-neighbor uh, -neighbor kind of burning. We've done some very extensive reviews. I've shared this with Walt Gessler. I wrote an article last summer that I would be happy to pass on to any of you who would like to read it. And I did an analysis of the farm liability policy. And the reason I've incorporated it in this presentation is I don't believe, and I'm willing to, to be tested on my theories, but we think the farm liability policy is the primary source of coverage for most landowners, but we don't think it's completely effective for insuring the landowner for prescribed fire. And the reason being, or outlined in this slide, in a farm liability policy, only designated premises are covered. It doesn't travel. So if you're a, a volunteer and you're going down to help your friend down the road do a burn, as a landowner, your insurance doesn't necessarily travel with you. That's an issue for volunteer burning. A policy, the farm liability policy, doesn't specifically define prescribed fire. And yet I see farmer and rancher after rancher going out there and performing it. Uh, it doesn't exclude it. In our industry, if prescribed fire is not excluded, most insurance underwriters believe that it's covered. I believe that a farmer that's performing a burn needs to get better definition from his local company or his agent. There is no trigger in the farm liability policy to pay fire suppression expense. Whether they would be excluded or not, it would be more on an individual case-by-case -case basis. But overall, we feel that that's a potential liability to the, to the landowner. Smoke as a pollutant, as I said a while ago, is not included except where there's a hostile fire. So in a normal day-to-day -day friendly fire prescribed burn, if uh, pollution was an issue for a claim for someone that might have been injured, you would not have any coverage for that. Certainly business pursuits, as many landowners would realize, are also excluded. But the most important aspect of this whole slide is volunteers in a farm liability policy are not uh, included as the named insured. Uh, we, we, we have not seen that uh, lack of definition really tested. We think it's a potential exposure for the private landowner who's burning. And then lastly, if a, if a permit is required, um, we know that a lot of folks, uh, 
if, if any of you are aware of the Flint Hills uh, area of Kansas, um, it's a it's a free for all burn down there. They've been doing it for a couple hundred years. We know that many landowners will burn on their own property where they, they may not necessarily know that a permit is required. Most of these policies exclude liability if a permit is required. We've seen a lot of, uh, around the country, a lot of landowners form burn cooperatives. Um, uh, and Barb and Robert, when your questions, I'll come back to you both on this issue. We, we believe that probably the most effective risk mitigation tool that's available to groups of people, whether it be public employees and or private individuals, is a burn cooperative. And the reason being is this. There isn't any clear definition, Barb, and I'll come back to your question about uh, whether you are a township individual. Um, and you really have to look at the township or the city's insurance if they're purchasing insurance, if they're part of a state municipal or fire department pool. Um, sometimes they offer a little broader coverage. But one of the perspectives here is that we've got private individuals working with public employees. And how to best define who has what liability can be done so in a private burn cooperative where public employees are members along with private individuals. In that regard, you can clearly define um, uh, the, the coverage exposures. You can develop a community for better understanding these issues. And you can purchase insurance as a community burn organization that indemnifies for all of these issues. We know of four or five insurance companies in this country that are offering insurance. Um, we offer the program at the top of that list, Gemini Insurance Company, which is part of the WR Berkeley Corporation. For those of you that might be listening that are members of the Association of Consulting Foresters, uh, ACF has endorsed the program through Philadelphia Insurance Company for some time. Uh, art specialty, for any of you that are on a fire suppression crew, art specialty does a program for fire suppression professionals. And then QBE specialty, Praetorian and Underwriters of Lloyd's all have an insurance program that's kind of born out of hunt club programs that a number of brokers have offered. They're really not prescribed fire programs per se. Um, the Philadelphia program is clearly a consulting forester program. It's not designed specifically for prescribed fire. So I've kind of rushed through all of this uh, material. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in here. Um, we uh, want. I, I guess it's kind of a conclusion for those of you that are that are in the the public arena. Um, I think you need to be very, very careful uh, as you look out at participating in burns with private citizens. I think you need to get real definition from those in, in an authority position and, and really investigate the dynamics of liability. Uh, can, can you be sued individually? Yes, you could be. Do you have immunity? Well, certainly there's ample precedent in the United States both in your state and, and federally to show that, yes, individuals uh, have the immunity and know they cannot be uh, held liable, yet uh, circumstances change with each given claim. And I think you certainly would be well advised to make sure that you, um, um, uh, you really investigate some of those uh, details. I do believe very strongly that burn associations can be a very effective tool. We're seeing them now in Nebraska. As I mentioned, there's 13 of them in Oklahoma, four or five of them in Kansas, uh, eight or 10 in uh, Texas. And we see the need more and more for community groups that can get a better understanding of these risks. So Mike, I think with um, I'm trying to stay within that 40-minute time frame. Uh, if I can answer more questions, uh, I'm certainly uh, willing to do so. It's kind of hard when I, I don't have the uh, 
um, you know, the whole perspective. But let me just scroll down here and um, try to deal with some questions. Barb, I hope I've answered your question about the liability of the township individual. Um, if I haven't, give me another question. Shelley Gorham, you're asking the question, if the state is conducting a prescribed burn that includes private land, what is the liability, if any, for the landowner? Well, if you look at the um, Helena National Forest burn and many others that have occurred where federal agencies have performed the, the burn, uh, the United States government clearly, when they started a fire, uh, is liable for potential damages. One of the one of the the kicks or one of the arguments that's put produced by the trial bar in many states around the country is these limitations that are set by by law, as you have in Minnesota, sometimes are not sufficient to clearly uh, indemnify the injured parties. Um, it's very very difficult to um, really get credible information about what the ultimate claim payout would be. For example, for those of you that are aware of or have seen some of the, the details of the Polk City, Florida burn off of Interstate 4, there were 20-some vehicles involved in the collision. Uh, there were four or five deaths. Uh, essentially, uh, it was an, a smoke inversion that caused a uh, major traffic pileup. Uh, and I believe, uh, if my facts are correct, that claim is still not completely settled, that there's still being damages awarded. Um, so I think uh, there, the, the private individual always has potential liability, as I said before. And um, if someone else does a burn and it would, uh, you know, uh, damage some of your farmland, I believe the direct liability would be on the entity that started the burn, but certainly your farm owner liability policy may respond accordingly. Let's see, Robert, you're asking the question, if a state employee, we're reviewing plans for private contractors, do we have any liabilities? Um, I get asked that question a lot, and I, I honestly can't answer the question. I think the issue would be that in the event that a claim of some magnitude occurred, I believe you would personally have some liability. Now, whether the state or other uh, governmental entity that employs you would indemnify you is something that I think you have to personally get some answers from. Well, I'm having kind of a, as we're scrolling down here, Shelley, um, let's see, I think I answered your question. Tom is asking the question, can you give us some examples of simple negligence? Um, let, let me just talk a little bit about that. In, in any given state, um, a litigant or a lawyer arguing in behalf of the plaintiff who's bringing the, a lawsuit against a burner is going to make the argument that, that the burner failed to follow a standard of care. That is the legal theory that, that, uh, that works. And that could be any number of situations. It could be weather related, such as um, that uh, in the like example of the Helena National Forest, when they started the burn, there were 12 to 15 mile an hour winds. The winds kicked up as the day warmed up. And, um, the argument could be made that they should have never done the burn based on the fact that the wind was too high. The standard of care says that you can manage the burn at a certain level of wind speed. You can't manage it at another level. Issue could also be um, that precautions were not taken for uh, potential loss. We have a claim in Florida, an open claim. By the way, we have two. We paid two claims in Minnesota for a private burner that we insure there. Both involved uh, burning across a boundary line marker that wasn't known. 
and damaged some uh, some some mature trees, and we paid property loss damages in excess of forty thousand. The claim in Florida is an example again of wind um, taking a six acre burn escape to burn two hundred acres. Um, Included in that 200 acres was a tree farm. There's about $50,000 worth of damages to the tree farm. Uh, and um, uh, we're, we're uh, essentially going to pay those uh, losses. Clearly, the biggest exposure to a, uh, to a burner is the liability from a traffic accident. Um, you know, depending on the type of fuel loads, certainly large brush piles can carry um, a greater distance of smoke travel. But you know, you have to be very, very careful um, that highways are clearly marked, uh, weather conditions don't cause an inversion, and, uh, and and I don't know that there's any way, truthfully, to really protect yourself from from that exposure, but that's probably the, the one that carries the greatest amount of damages. OK, let's see. Tom Rush, Doug, Minnesota has a permission to burn lands not administered by the DNR. The state assumes risk, in this case, up to the limits of the Tort Claims Act. I assume the landowner would be liable beyond the limits of the, of the tort. Yeah, that would be an interesting question to investigate. Um, you know, again, many of these uh, tort claim issues are state specific. And Tom, to be honest with you, um, I didn't have the, the the time, nor am I an attorney that really has access to some of the that the legal information to really kind of help your answer. But that's a really good question, and your answer is probably correct that the landowner would be liable in excess of those. I'm not real sure as I read your question, though. Um, plans not administered by the DNR. We'll have to take a look at that. Does any, anybody else have any more information they'd like to share before we close out? And Mike, I think that's all the questions. I think we have one more uh, typing a question, Nancy. So I'll wait for that question to come up. Thank you, Doug. And then David Gantz had a question. Did you? Um, OK. That one? You go Tom back. Rush is also doing. So we'll get these last few questions in here before we close out. And then please define standard of care. Um, well, that's a very interesting question that will, will depend on um, uh, each state. Um, standard of care in in a generalized form would be um, one of the following issues. One would be a burn plan itself. A written prescription to do the burn included in that prescription would be um, the location of the burn, the, uh, the designated fuel loads, um, the objectives and goals of the burn, um, what uh, public notice is and how public notice is being given to residents near or around, how public roadways are being marked, how, how and what um, public fire suppression agencies are being notified. So a complete burn plan with all of those pieces would be sort of the cornerstone of standard of care. Certainly then weather conditions, um, aggressive fuel loads, uh, any of those, I you know, would would all be subject to some scrutiny in in event of a lawsuit. Uh, clearly, the experience of the burners um, in virtually all of these claims, the axis of all liability is sits squarely on the shoulders of the burn boss. If if a if it's a private burn, choosing the right burn boss that's experienced with those fuel loads and these conditions in your state. Uh, would would be a foundation of a standard of care. The crew itself, uh, we see a lot of um, volunteers, state and federal employee, as well as private citizens doing a lot of volunteering around the country. And they have a serious experience in, uh, in prescribed burning. Uh, I think all of those sort of make up that standard of care, Tom. 
property damage to trees, value at the time, not future worth right, is replacement of the trees included? Well, what we typically see in, uh, in tree farm claims where the property loss is on the trees, the land, the tree farm owner or the landowner will ask for the full mature value of the tree and historically that's the way the claim has been paid. So if you have a one-year-old sapling, it's one thing, but if you have a, a 10-year-old pine forest that's damaged and it has a 20-year maturity, um, you're going to get some multiple of that maturity in a hardwood forest. Um, certainly uh, the same kind of formula would be uh, applicable. Let's see, it's the last... Uh, Hey, Doug, uh, if you scroll back, uh, David Kantz had a uh, question regarding if the state rights plan, a plan for private contractors to burn on private land, could the state be held liable? See that? Yes, and I believe um, they could be, David, and that would be more direct question, I think, for the state's legal advisor. Um, to be very honest with you, we really haven't seen enough litigation to really test a lot of these theories, so that makes it even more difficult uh, to do your jobs and even to do mine, because a lot of this is speculation. But in the event that you wrote a, um, a, a plan and it was performed and now there is a significant traffic pile up and there's multiple deaths or serious injury, uh, litigation experts are going to go after everybody. And if it's a private individual, again, they're going to make a case that uh, if, um, if you, are, you acted within or outside the scope of your employment, um, th they're going to make that argument one way or the other. Uh, but I believe that the state could be held liable for those uh, damages. We've done some work with uh, some conservation districts uh, in a couple of states. I'm not exactly sure how Minnesota organizes their, their uh, local conservation districts, but in Illinois, uh, for example, uh, conservation districts are all uh, 501c3 private corporations, but they're funded through the state by the Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, which also is a 501c3 corporation. Uh, in that particular case, um, we've, we've often been asked, well, does the state then assume the liability for these 501c3s? And the answer is, I, I would, it's, again, I don't, I don't know the, all the details, but I would assume that they do not. So hopefully, David, that answers your question. I think you need to, to do some additional investigation. Um, all right, let me come down here. Nancy, we think we answered your question. I guess that's, is that all of them now, I guess? Or here's Tom writing one more. How much is the premium for a standard policy? Good question, Tom. I was trying to keep my sales cap off. Uh, I'll tell you two, two, I'll give you two answers to that question. Uh, we have uh, a million dollar policy, the minimum premium for a burner is roughly $1,500 per year. If we, if we do the double aggregate, it's $2,500 a year. Uh, we know those prices are competitive. However, for a burn association, just to show you what we've done with a couple of policies we've, we've uh, written in Texas, and where, where we really believe the, the power and the, and the value is in the mass in the community, for Edwards Plateau Prescribed Burn Association, there are 350 members participating in this policy we give various limits depending upon uh, what role is being performed, uh, but the, the rate is roughly uh, $10 per member and $40 per burn. So it's a fairly, fairly inexpensive policy, and we're also proposing the same thing for the Alliance of Oklahoma Prescribed Burn Associations, where it's a very manageable policy and its intent is really designed to cover the volunteers. So we can look at any group for that matter. Um, in terms of state or federal employee, or I'm sorry, for state 
or municipal employees fire department, there is no policy currently available. We're looking at the concept of, a, of writing a program much like is available today for federal law enforcement where you can buy a private policy to cover any personal liability as a federal law enforcement officer. We're looking at doing that same thing for um, uh, state and municipal employees. And Tom, you're asking again, could employees form a burn association to limit costs? And the answer is yes, you could. You, you could form a coalition of burn professionals uh, that were there to do volunteer work. You could define it in any way you wanted as long as you can get uh, state status or you can get sort of business status in your state. Uh, it technically could be an insurable entity and a policy theoretically could be written. Doug, there's a number of other questions if you back up. OK, sorry. Oh, for whatever reason, Mike, I'm having uh, David writes, when the state is working with contractors, what is the best way to reduce our liability? Well, um, you know, I, I believe the first question you, you'd want to ask, David, is to make sure that uh, the contractor has insurance uh, and, and uh, make him show you the coverage. One of the things that we found out is that prescribed burning is, by and large, kind of a part-time activity for a lot of these individuals. And hidden uh, kind of underneath uh, maybe a landscaper, or he could be a, a, a habitat restoration professional. Uh, and he's classified as such. And, and we've kind of found that a lot of insurance underwriters sort of turn the cheek a little bit for prescribed fire. And we think a lot of those guys are one claim and, and we're going to get canceled kind of kind of policies. And we're very cautious about advising these guys accordingly. Uh, I had a guy approach me from the state of Iowa a couple weeks ago that his primary business is in native habitat restoration and landscaping, native grass planting, tree planting, yet he does maybe a dozen or two burns a year. And He's advised the agent that he does this burning, but I'm not, he wasn't comfortable, and I'm certainly not comfortable when I talk to many of these professionals around the country that they are, their underwriter is really aware. And in the event of a significant claim, there's, a, there's an issue. So David, to come back to your question, I think you have every right to make sure that you're applying a standard to the need for that coverage. And that would be my best view of how to protect the state. Back up here again. Robert asked the question, is there a time? Michael, I'm assuming, can everybody read these questions, or should I? They no, can't. everyone can read them. OK. Well, question, is there a time for liability, for instance, at a, at a an escape several days after the burn when, a, when the fire when the burn may have been turned back to the landowner. Interesting situation I'll just describe to you. I just got report of this the other day uh, in Texas. Uh, was a landowner burn. Um, they had a plan. A prescription was written by a volunteer who's had years of experience in burning in Texas. They went in and it was uh, they were they were doing about a 200 acre or I'm sorry about a 60 acre burn, and they wanted to burn around some utility poles, which they did. Um, they did that as a pre-burn activity. Um, they went out the next day. They did the burn, and then two days later, the burn escaped, uh, burned a couple hundred additional acres. And they believe there was embers from around the utility lines that caused the, uh, the escape. Thankfully, there are no damages, uh, or at least there has none been reported. Um, but uh, in, in that particular case, the landowner could be held responsible as well as the burner. Generally, most liability actions fall right in the lap of the burner, whether it's volunteer or not. Have I answered now again? Uh, 
most of these. I, I think you have. Um, what I'm doing right now is I just uh, put your uh, phone number up on screen. In case people have other questions, they could contact you directly. Is that fine now that I've done it? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, appreciate that okay. you welcome me into your, your, uh, you know, your discussion today, and I'm happy to try to help in any way I can. Sometimes they're really not easy answers to a lot of these questions, but we're certainly willing to work hard to try to find them out for everybody. Well, you brought a lot of expertise uh, to the webinar today, Doug. I appreciate your time and your exp expertise sharing all your um, your experience uh, with the burn liability. Um, most of the people online are the are DNR foresters, but we have a, other people, including um, the Forest Service and, and some private people as well. So thank you uh, again, Doug. I appreciate your time and expertise again. Those of you online, if you have questions, other questions for Doug, uh, feel free to contact him uh, at the number that I've, I've typed in. Um, so I'm going to move on, uh, but just let you know that uh, the webinar will be um, archived on the uh, SFEC website, so you can go back and, and look at it again. There was a request for me to send out the PowerPoint to, uh, to those of you in the audience. I can do that. Uh, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, and so for future reference, we have about 10 webinars coming up. The next one is Forest Management Concepts in Asia, Will the Tigers Survive with Professor Dave Smith. That's March 22nd. Phenology and Climate Change, How Timing of Biological Activity Affects Forest Now and in the Future with Rebecca Montgomery on April 2nd. We have a major program coming up uh, on March 15th. Restoration of permanent openings, including right-of-ways. That's at Bemidji State University. So Tom Hewitt with the, um, the Chippewa National Forest help, is helping to lead that effort. And uh, we have a, a really fine slate of presenters. So check that out on the SFEC website if you'd like to attend. There's an advanced GPS training. Adam Sutherland with uh, UPM Blandon has helped to put that program together. So that's also going to be a very good program, April 12th. So with that in mind, I thank all of you. Thank you, Mike. Online. Yeah, and thank you, Doug, again, for your fine uh, presentation. And I'm going to stay online a little bit, but uh, we'll conclude at this time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll be online with Iowa State University, Marty, who is helping us with the technical support. So, okay, uh, talk to you later. Okay, thank you, Doug.